active on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. This is the South Florida Tech Podcast, a weekly show where we bring you the awesome, innovative people building our South Florida tech community. Each week, we'll introduce you to one of the Sunshine State's top tech leaders, learn more about who they are, what they do, and have some fun conversation along the way. Our podcast is, of course, presented by the South Florida Tech Association, a nonprofit dedicated to building South Florida into a tech hub. And I'm your host, Joe Russo, President and CEO. Uh, first of all, shout out to our sponsors, uh, Emerge Americas. Uh, the uh, awesome team down there uh, each year holds an event uh, bringing together global enterprises, disruptive technology, and elite startups uh, at the premier tech event connecting the Americas. Uh, it's held in Miami Beach and today has hosted o uh, organizations and people from over 40 countries and featuring over 250 speakers. Uh, they are helping transform South Florida into a tech hub. Uh, really looking forward to uh, that event next year. Obviously, this year's had to be uh, put on hold, but uh, it should be a really awesome event. So thank you to the team out there for supporting our podcast and for supporting our South Florida tech community. Uh, with that, I would love to uh, introduce our guest for today. Uh, his name is Mark Bolchek, and he is the founding partner of Las Olas uh, Venture Capital, one of the founding partners, I should say. Uh, an early stage venture uh, fund focused on Florida and underserved venture capital markets based uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, hence uh, the name Las Olas. Uh, Mark holds a, a BA and a master's in economics from Yale University. So starting off strong there in his career, uh, he spent 15 years at Hire One, a company he co-founded in 2000 while a senior in college. He helped grow it from just three founders to more than 1,000 employees and guide the company through multiple acquisitions exceeding $150 million in aggregate value. Um, in addition, he is a director of the Florida Institute uh, here in uh, South Florida, an organization that helps budding entrepreneurs uh, get their company started. Uh, he was the Ernst Young Entrepreneur of the Year uh, 2010 um, in the uh, New England Financial Service Awards. Uh, and uh, you know, in addition to that, serves the Florida Venture Forum uh, on the executive committee as the program chair. So I think I got all that uh, just generally in there. Mark is a very awesome fellow and very accomplished uh, entrepreneur. Uh, looking forward to uh, the conversation here today, Mark, and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, tell us a little bit more about you. I mean, generally, uh, who is Mark? What do you do? Uh, what, what's uh, life like in the, in the day of uh, in, in the day of yourself? Sure. So, you know, you covered some of the background. And so I really think of myself as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, as, as you uh, mentioned in the intro, I started a company back in 1999 as a senior in college and um, grew that through lots of different um, phases. Um, we raised angel money, then venture capital money. We ultimately um, sold a part of the company to a private equity firm. Then we took the company public in 2010. Um, and then ultimately took the company private in 2016. Um, and that was sort of the end of my relationship with my own company. Um, I left my uh, full-time role there in 2014 and moved to Florida um, full-time um, and uh, was looking sort of for my next challenge. And since I loved working with tech companies, I loved working with entrepreneurs. Um, I had been doing angel investing for a long time before starting the venture capital firm and said, you know, let me professionalize that. So I got together with Dean Hatton, who was one of my partners at Hire One, and we decided to start an early stage venture capital firm called Las Olas Venture Capital. And um, we think, you know, the South Florida market or the Florida market in general is very underserved in terms of professional investors. And that's really a core ingredient to building great early stage tech companies is being able to find that capital, um, ideally locally, and um, that's really what we set out to do with Las Olas. Awesome. So tell us a, a little bit more here about, you got to help me. You founded the company while you're in college, a senior uh, at Yale, uh, and you were uh, part of the Yale Entrepreneurship Society as, as well uh, with all that. But how did this, this company come about? You're in college, you got this idea, you're putting it together. And you take it from step one to, you know, to, to exit in your career. Like, talk about the early days there. Yeah. So the way I really met my two co-founders, we had actually started the Yale Entrepreneurial Society um, in early 1999. 
And um, we were really trying to bring entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education to Yale University, which at the time was really focused on liberal arts. There was really no entrepreneurship program on campus at the time. And we were all interested in doing something more, you know, startup oriented um, post graduation. And so we started the Entrepreneurial Society to really promote that. We started a business plan competition. And as we were sort of doing that, we really said what we really wanted to do was start a company. So since I knew my two co founders were very passionate about um, changing the world and you know fixing problems that we knew. And one of the things that we had identified was that there were no good financial services um, for students and parents to interact with the university. Everything was paper-based at the time from your financial aid, your billing, everything was paper and through the US mail. And so we set out to change that. Um, but we didn't know much about you know tech companies nor you know fundraising or uh, all the other things you need to be an entrepreneur. So we really expanded our team. That was really key. One of the things we realized, and, and I think this is an important lesson for all entrepreneurs, is make sure to expand the team to cover areas that you don't know. So one of the first people we hired um, was a VP of sales. We hired a CTO. Um, we brought on a VP of banking who helped us you know, navigate the banking system, which was going to be the back end for our company. Um, and then two years in, we brought in Dean Hatton as our CEO, and I took the CFO role um, because we believed we needed to bring in the best people around us to really build a great company. Um, and the most, that was the most important thing. Um, and so I think that's really how we got it from kind of, you know, the early, early days through like the first few years is really focused on bringing the best people in to help us run the company. Yeah, so you kind of looked at it like, hey, I'm one of the founders, but you know, the best seat for me is this and the best person for that is him to help build the company, build the growth, build um, your equity stake in it was understanding kind of, hey, you know, I might have been one of the guys here first, but that doesn't mean I'm always the right guy for, for this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all kind of played whatever role made sense at the time. Um, so I was CEO for the first two years, then it was CFO for nine years. And then I became CEO of the public company again when Dean um, didn't want to be, you know, after the IPO, he had told us that he was not excited about being a public company executive again. He had done that in a previous um, phase of his career. And so I became CEO of the public company in 2011. And I did that for three years. And then I figured out that that's not really what I wanted to do either. And I was burned out. I mean, after 15 years, um, it was time for me to do something else. And that sort of started the transition for me out of the company in 2014. So but the key is anytime you're building a startup or an early stage company, the key is to focus on whatever the roles are that match best to people's expertise and what the company needs. I mean, we had folks that, you know, moved around the company over the years um, and we encouraged people to do that because sometimes the best thing was to somebody in the sales team may not be, you know, aggressive enough or maybe burned out. So they don't want to be in sales anymore, but they might be a great client manager, a relationship manager. And so, we often try to move people around the company to help find better roles for, you know, really smart, dedicated people. Well, was that a big thing for you though? When you, when you were obviously there, uh, one of the co-founders saying I'm the CEO and I'm going to step back. I mean, that sounds like a, a, a big thing for somebody who is in charge to, to step away from that leadership role for, uh, for the better of the company and the team and everybody around. Yeah, I mean, it was really more of a, a team effort. So we never really, you know, Miles and I and Dean, essentially the three of us ran the company for most of those formative years. Um, and Miles was one of my co-founders. He became COO, I was CFO, and Dean was CEO. And we really ran the company as a three-person team. We were very, very close. Um, we were also, also became very close personal friends. Um, so we really ran it as sort of, a, you know, a three-person team and there was really very little territories because we all had a big equity stake um we kind of all were on the same page and in some ways i looked at dean as ceo he would take care of things that i didn't know how to do so the first time we had to you know terminate somebody or let somebody go i'd never fired anybody so i said dean you do it um and that was sort of you know he was an experienced executive and he was like a mentor to us in the early days um, and he literally did all the things that Miles and I didn't know how to do or didn't want to do. I mean, that sort of was a different way to think about it rather than, you know, I'm giving up my role. 
I was excited to have somebody to give things to that I didn't know how to do and that would be better for our company. And we were selling to CFOs of universities. And yeah. so you can imagine as a 22 year old to walk into the CFO of a university and say, why don't you wire us your entire financial aid money, which could be hundreds of millions of dollars, and we'll take care of distributing that for you. That didn't go across very well. And so having senior people around us that you know, looked the part and were more credible to that audience was really important. And that's why we hired a VP of sales who was 20 years older than us. We hired a CEO who was 20 years older. Um, and our VP of sales, uh, our VP of banking, I think he was around 60 when we hired him and he retired wow. you know, six or seven years later. But that was important for the regulators to see somebody who had been there, knew the rules, knew how to inter uh, interface with the regulators. So it's really important to have that team and work together in whatever roles make sense. So let's move the, the conversation over to the, the stage two in your career. Here you are now, you're a venture capitalist. You're uh, you know, one of the, the, the top guys at Las Olas Venture Capital. I know it's a small firm, so maybe you can speak a little bit to that and your, your colleagues there. But um, you, know, you started this and to, to look at not only investing in, but also you know, being a part of being a support system to all of these great companies. So um, maybe you kind of speak to uh, how you, you got started in all of that, because although it might be you know, a natural progression to some, it is obviously a career switch in a way. Um, and you know, you're going to be facing some new challenges just as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, starting a venture capital firm is very much like a starting a, a startup. I mean, it is a startup. Um, when we started, we had no, no entity, no capital. Um, you know, the one big difference is that we did have some of our own capital that we invested. That was really step one. Um, and then we drew on our network to bring in friends and family capital. And that's really how we got the first close. Um, on the venture fund done. So it was somewhat of an extension of our investing activity in the, from the angel sort of investing period. So Dean and I had been angel investing together um, since 2008. Um, and more, we had more and more relationships with other people who had co-invested with us before. And so there was somewhat of a logical sort of progression from angel investing to creating LLCs where we would pool the money for friends and family and, and make investments together. And then forming venture, the venture capital firm, obviously, is a um, more professional approach. We look at it as a full-time job. We you know, look at deals every day. We take calls. Um, we have full-time staff. Um, but ultimately, it is an extension. But it is changing your mindset. So as an entrepreneur, you're really focused on one company for many years at a time. Versus as a venture capitalist, you're really focused on at least a few companies. It's actually not as different as people expect. As a board member, um, you know, I have right now four different companies I'm on the board of, um, and that's a big part of my role. I would say there's three parts of being a venture capitalist. One is sort of, you know, raising the capital for the fund. Then there's the, you know, looking at new opportunities to invest. So looking at companies, business plans, listening to that, uh, you know, pitches and going to conferences and, and finding the next great company and the next great entrepreneur. And then the third piece is working with the companies you've invested in. So, um, and I think all three of those to me are actually interesting. You know, a lot of people don't like fundraising, but I actually think it's exciting to tell the story, tell people why they should invest in our fund. And part of that is telling them about the great companies we invested in, in fund one. Like now when we're raising fund two, we tell them the stories about fund one, how we found the opportunities about the great progress, the entrepreneurs. So it's kind of like telling that story is exciting. And then working on finding new opportunities, that actually is probably often the most frustrating. We, we look at over a thousand different business plans or pitch decks a year to make only three or four investments on average. So that we end up saying no a lot of time. Um, and I wish we could say yes more often, but given that we have a limited fund, and we're very high conviction investors. So we wanna find a few opportunities that we really believe in and then put a significant check in and significant time and effort to help them. And so that ends up you know, meaning that we say no more than 99% of the time, um, but we try to be helpful and point people in the right direction. Um, and then I think the most exciting part is working with the entrepreneurs and being a sounding board and having gone through building a company from three people to over a thousand people it gives me the perspective to be able to help um, the entrepreneurs through things that they may not have done before. So 
maybe they're trying to raise a series B or maybe they're, they're having a problem with one of the board members. And, you know, they call me up and say, well, how do I get this person, you know, off the board? And, you know, there's things that come up that I've dealt with over the 15 years of building my own company that I now can, you know, be helpful to the entrepreneurs. But often the biggest challenge is, you know, go to market. How do you help companies find the right path to growth? And then capital strategy. I mean, ultimately, most companies need to raise capital to be successful. And we see that a big part of our role is to help them not only put our, get our capital, but then help them find that next round of capital from a bigger firm, a Series A or Series B firm, um, depending on their needs. Yeah, so you're really keen on the whole mentorship aspect of all of this. And, and that, that's pretty refreshing to hear. Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of people watch Shark Tank and then they see like, oh, okay, you get the money and that's it. But it's a lot more than that. Yeah, and, and every company has different needs, right? Depending if it's a first-time entrepreneur, um, you know, in my in our portfolio, we have entrepreneurs, you know, in their 20s or in their, you know, 40s or 50s. You know, this might be the third company. So it's very different what their needs are, but everybody needs help and everybody can use more introductions, more leads. Um, and that's really what we try to do is we, we adapt how we help the company based on what the company needs and what stage they're at. Um, and that changes over time as well, right? When the board is maybe only three people and we're the only professional investor, we play a different role than maybe later in this company's life cycle where they have outside capital. Maybe that capital is not as friendly as we are. So we become more entrepreneur focused and trying to help the entrepreneur navigate what might be a more difficult capital um, structure at that time. So it really depends um, where the company is and where our role fits in. And that's different for every single company. There's no sort of like cookie cutter approach in venture capital, at least for us. <laughs> no, I, I can imagine every company is different. Uh, it's all different challenges. But, you know, let's talk lately. I mean, obviously COVID's going on still when, as we're, we're talking here recording this. Um, how has that affected uh, you, you guys, your team there is how you're looking at companies and then maybe overall, you know, what do you see as the state of venture capital now, uh, considering the uncertainty that really exists in the world around us? Yeah, so first, you know, what I would say is that, you know, I think as the crisis hit in sort of March and April, I think the focus was working with our portfolio companies um, and figuring out kind of that mix of, you know, how is everybody getting impacted? And unfortunately, you know, they're out of the crisis, they're winners and losers um, in the portfolio. And some companies have gotten significantly impact on the negative. Um, something happened to their market or they're somehow, you know, selling to businesses that have to be shut down because of the, um, you know, pandemic. On the flip side, there's some portfolio companies that have been able to take advantage of the opportunity because they have software that, you know, helps people work remotely or they have, um, uh, or one of our companies helps coordinate last mile logistics. So with a lot of the retail stores being less frequented, there's more online shopping and brands are trying to figure out how to create a better experience. Um, so that was really the first phase as the pandemic hit is to make sure the companies that are the winners are take advantage of the opportunity. They have enough capital. They know how to do what they need to do. And then those companies that are negatively impacted, um, there we really focused on how do you stay alive post pandemic and how do you have enough runway? And so there we're really focused on making sure companies had enough money to survive through next summer, next fall. Um, and sometimes that meant, you know, can we raise some more capital somewhere? Can we uh, reduce costs? So in some cases we did have to um, lay off some staff um, and, you know, we navigated that. So that's really the first few months. And then I think come May and June, I think people knew what was happening. I think people sort of got used to sort of the crisis as the new normal and started you know, just operating and, and working our way out of the, the situation. Um, for us, in terms of new investments, we made our last investment in February, which was, a, you know, one of the investments we were doing pre-COVID. And we've looked at a number of opportunities since then, haven't invested in anything yet. Um, I think the challenges are that in April, May, a lot of people that were raising capital were doing, were sort of distressed. And venture capital firms like ours don't really do well in situations where you know you have to move very quickly or the distress situation or 
you know, down rounds. It's really not what we do. We normally like to partner with the entrepreneur um, in a situation where there's growth and there's opportunity. Um, and so we kind of sat out that, you know, the few months around the COVID peaks. But over the last like 30 to 60 days, we've started seeing some really interesting opportunities, what I would call post COVID opportunities. So these are, you know, digital healthcare opportunities, fixing problems that became more apparent because of COVID. Our healthcare system has been broken for a long time, um, but I think COVID has highlighted certain aspects. And so we're starting to see some really interesting applications to say, okay, this is a problem that should have been fixed a long time ago, but now is really a great time to address that. And here's some technology and here's how we can fix it. And so I think, um, you know, we're actively looking for opportunities and investments to make. Um, and I think, in hindsight, companies sort of that started or raised early money in 2020 and 2021 will end up being some great, great winners and great success stories because I think people now understand better what needs to be done. I do think the world will normalize sometime over the next six to 12 months and uh, we'll start seeing a lot of uh, positive things happening. So that's kind of, you know, my quick COVID. Uh, COVID the, the, the quick one. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it too. I mean, it, it's only a matter of time before we see um, some, I think, good opportunities come up too. And, you know, there will be, probably doesn't seem like it now, there will be a, uh, a valley uh, once we get over this hill. And that's when I think there's going to be a lot of really great success stories that come out of it. Um, and so, you know, with that, I, I would love to just shift the conversation to you for a second, learn more about Mark. Uh, I know we were talking if, right before we started recording here about uh, you getting out and uh, getting some lobsters uh, for, for mini season. But, you know, amongst other things, like what do you like to do on the weekends? What gets you outdoors? What gets you out of the office and really kind of uh, brings you some joy and brings you some, uh, uh, some relaxation amongst the craziness that you have going on sometimes? Yeah, so certainly scuba diving has been a passion of mine for a long time. I think over 20 years now. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's great. I mean, there's some great scuba diving in South Florida and the Keys and certainly, you know, an avid lobster hunter, at least a few times a year during mini season. And um, tomorrow's the first day of commercial lobster season. So um, that's another opportunity to get a few more lobsters. Um, so that's exciting. But I think a lot of my free time ends up being travel. So, and that's certainly become more complicated in this COVID world we live in. Um, but I generally travel a lot, um, combining business and pleasure travel. And I'm often on the road for various different things. And I love hiking and the national parks and a lot of other um, stuff. And it's actually this year at the beginning, again, March and April, I was mostly at home. And I think all of us were sort of trying to figure out, you know, how long this will last and then what we can do. But then after that, I said, you know, I should probably make the best of it. And so um, we're starting to look at opportunities as the national parks open. And so I think um, it's been really cool. Like I was at Yellowstone, I think a few days after they opened the south entrance and there was nobody in the park. Um, I was out there with some friends and I mean, it was unbelievable. It was like a VIP tour of Yellowstone. And after that, we flew down to the Grand Canyon and, and went hiking there and um, Again, very, very few people. It was almost like a once in a lifetime opportunity to see these parks the way they were really intended to be, um, not overrun with buses and, and tourists, but really nature and animals. And it was really, really cool. And then a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to go up to Alaska for two weeks. Um, and again, do you know some of the more remote aspects of Alaska and do some halibut fishing and just some really cool stuff that, you know, in a normal year, you would have to, a lot of these lodges are often booked like a year in advance. But during this crisis, it's very difficult to travel because of testing requirements and other things. And so I would encourage everybody to sort of, you know, travel within the constraints of the crisis and certainly be responsible. But outdoor activities right now are probably the best thing you can do is be outdoors, be in the mountains, um, be in the fresh air and away from lots of people and, and kind of, uh, you know, such a beautiful country we have in the US. Um, often we travel internationally, we go all over the world and we probably don't spend enough time in our own country. And there's so much cool stuff to see. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing for the last few months on the personal level. No, I was just in Asheville speak of uh, this past weekend. Uh, now, and I gotta say like, I, I've done Nashville and Asheville 
which is very confusing when you're trying to explain the two cities you've been to have basically the same name. But um, that that's always been something you know I'm, I'm looking at here, especially with COVID going on. Like, hey, um, get out of the house, start um, figuring out what to do, when to do it, things like that, um, just to uh, you know keep your sanity a little bit. But hey, we have an opportunity to see the world. Um, and speak up, I went to Yellowstone a couple of years ago uh, and loved it. The one thing was like every single camper you can imagine was just lined up everywhere. <laughs> And I'm looking, I'm like, is this Disney World or is this a national park? So you were pretty lucky in uh, seeing it really how it's meant to be seen. And that's with um, with no one really around. So very envious of you for that one. Uh, any, uh, any other little hobbies or skills that you've picked up with over COVID though? Um, you know, I've probably spent more time, you know, working out and uh, it's actually in some ways it's made me more efficient because the travel, obviously going to the office, going to meetings takes a lot more time. So you can actually get a lot of work done in a more compressed schedule. And I find that it's easier to have a regular workout routine um, in the mornings because I'm not running off to a breakfast meeting or to a conference or jumping on an airplane as often. So I think that's been another thing for me. I feel like I've you know, gone out to eat less. I've eaten healthier at home. I've worked out more. Um, and I think those are all important things that, that are always important to me, but I think they've become easier to do during COVID than they were, you know, sort of in, a, in the normal hectic, you know, life that we normally live. Yeah, I, I hear you. I'm trying to get to the gym a little bit too, but, you know, not, not really getting as much as I want to in there. Um, that, that said, I, I want to close out here with, um, you know, one or two more questions before we uh, hit our time. Um, and that's first, what advice would you have for uh, an aspiring founder or technology leader in South Florida today? As somebody who's been there, done that, and has some, some advice to give. Sure. I, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that I encourage folks is if you have a great idea and you really want to start your own company, then, you know, there's never a better time to do it than today. I see a lot of folks that I talk to that have been thinking or working on something for years and it never gets off the ground because they don't actually dedicate themselves to it and, and don't believe it, they can do it. So I think the key, particularly now post COVID, I think is a great opportunity to assemble a team and pursue your dreams and really make a difference. And if you've been thinking about something for a while, generally ideas don't get better with time. Um, if you have a great idea, that's a great business today, it's probably not going to be three years from now because someone else will already have done it or the world will have changed. And so I think now is a great time to start a business. I think there's a lot of great talent available, people that are not happy at their businesses or have been laid off for reasons, you know, not their problem. It was, you know, their companies had issues. And so um, we're seeing a lot of our portfolio companies are having great success hiring a talent. And so that's really my advice to entrepreneurs is, you know, do what you know, you're passionate about and then never give up. Um, in the end, companies fail when people give up. Um, and I, I say that sort of half jokingly because actually often the advice I do give folks when they've been trying something for years and it's not working, there is the right time to give up, but I guess don't give up too early. Um, yeah. Make sure you give it a good try so you don't have regrets you know, for years to come that you think you could have done something and, it, and never tried hard enough. Yeah. And one last question is, what's one call to action that you have for our South Florida tech community? Yeah, so I think one of the big challenges for, for the tech ecosystem is not enough connectivity. So I really, I think the call to action for all of us is to try to build more of those relationships and really become more of a tech community. And I know there's lots of um, folks trying to do that, but it's sort of never enough. Um, and so I feel like we all should try to do more of that. And it's become more difficult through COVID, but I've you know, consistently been trying to reach out to folks. And I have a list of folks that I try to reach out to on a regular basis to try to keep that connectivity going. And for me, again, it's mostly other funds so that we talk and we, we share um, what we're seeing. But I think in general, in the tech community, it's important to be conscious and make a proactive effort um, to, to create more of that connectivity and create more of a community around uh, the tech ecosystem. Yeah, and of course, that's what we're trying to do here with South Florida Tech, but exactly. you know, there's a lot of, 
th there's a lot of bits and pieces that go into uh, that from uh, groups like 1909 here in West Palm Beach, supporting entrepreneurs, FAU Tech Runway, uh, venture capital organizations like Los Olas Venture Capital. It is one big tent in our tech industry and our tech community down here. And I really, really, really thank you for being a part of it and for uh, spending the time uh, with us here today, for serving uh, and um, being out there so much. And if anybody wants to get involved in South Florida Tech, uh, you can go online, uh, go to southfloridatech.com, uh, get involved, join as a member, uh, and you know just be a part of this great community we have going here. Uh, with that, one big shout out to, to our uh, producing sponsors at Media Ops, uh, Alan Bryan over there uh, helped put together the uh, pr production of the podcast. Uh, they are the premier global media platform for technical communities like DevOps.com, Container Journal, Security Boulevard. Go check them out. They have a wonderful following and great, some great content. And of course, thank you to our guests. Thank you to Mark uh, for being here, for talking with us and uh, being a great part of our South Florida tech community. Great. Thank you. And thanks for putting this on. Thanks, Mark. You have a good one, friend. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye.